possible and we weren't in our virtual world, you would receive a standing ovation for this talk, but more importantly, for the critical work you've been doing in this pandemic. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite um, our speakers to join me um, live and uh, to take questions to um, address the issues in their talks. Um, the panelists can all press their blue buttons and join me. So Liz and Lynn, see myself twice. I hope you don't. <laughs> Daniel, uh, welcome. I'm sorry. I, I originally planned to be here with a tie. <laughs> but then the, the, the day was just a little bit different from my plan. You look very authentic. Thank you. <laughs> And Mo, are you with us as well? Yes, there you are. Okay, fantastic. So um, let, let's start. Um, and please, as we're talking, uh, enter in your, your questions um, so that we can um, offer them to the speakers. So one question we've received is for Dr. Mockinson. Um, are children being asymptomatic and with high viral load more likely to transmit infections, especially to susceptible adults in the family? Yeah, I don't know what more likely means, whether more likely means than somebody is symptomatic. I, I would think that based on the viral load data that children are as infectious as adults, but not necessarily more infectious than than adults. So I don't think there's a difference between whether you're symptomatic or not symptomatic. Okay, thanks. Um, Liz, um, coming off the vaccine talk, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about the implications of Ms. C or PIMS for a vaccine development in children, whether we have to think differently about it. Thanks, Elaine. I think that's a really important question and one of the reasons why all of the studies trying to un understand the pathogenesis of PIMS and MIS-C is so important. Um, we have hypothesized that it's antibody driven and if that's the case and we go with a vaccine that produces antibodies, are we risking this as a side effect, particularly in younger children who seem to develop this phenomenon? Um, and so we would be in favour of, of waiting till we have more information about MIS-C before introducing the vaccine to children who, as Lynn so eloquently put, really don't have a need for a vaccine because they have such mild disease and we should preserve it for those who are most vulnerable whilst we gather more information. Hopefully we're wrong and the vaccine doesn't do anything of that sort at all, but we need to know before we move on. Fantastic. Um, Daniel, I think the, there's some, some skepticism about whether a neonatal COVID syndrome exists. Could you speak to that a little bit? Um, I believe that there is a sort of a psychological reaction here, especially from those that are not into neonatal critical care. Uh, nobody clearly would like to, uh, to see a neonate suffering. But the reality is that neonatal COVID is rare, indeed, but it does exist. And those who actually um, uh, do the job, uh, more or less, either they saw some cases from mild to moderate, or if they have been unlucky, they even seen some severe cases. Right now, I can tell you because our is a small world, there is a baby in Buenos Aires under VA ECMO with a severe organ failure and a positive for varemia. So with circulating SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, in, in the blood. Uh, there has been another ARDS severe almost at the border of ECMO who got published in pediatrics a week ago from London. We personally have seen a cerebral vasculitis and as you know, we um, did a synthesis and a meta-analysis of all the cases reported so far, reported until September, and got published in Nature Communication a few weeks ago. Um, and these were more or less 180 cases of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 neonatal infections around the world. So if we look at the data, the neonatal infection 
seems to be uh, more or less 3% of pregnancy. So it's not a high, not at all. And of these 3%, the severe cases are uncommon, really. But it does exist. Can I take it and sort of back in time? And what, what, and you probably don't do it personally, but what do your obstetricians say to women who are considering becoming pregnant during this pandemic or who are pregnant? How, we, uh, what do you tell both, them? both the obstetricians and us as a neonatologist, we have a clear, uh, let's say, talk explaining that the risk is low but it's not zero. And babies cannot be considered protected somehow from consequences of these infections. We, after the experience that we accumulated with the first pandemic wave, we decided to have a politics right after the delivery, uh, let's say a wise policy, which consists in telling the parents that if the mother is no more symptomatic, or anyway, it's considered to be no more contagious because of the time and go infection. The baby can stay with the mother without any problem, enforcing the aging measures and so on. But if the mother is into the, let's say, highest contagious period, so let's say during the, during the, the, the symptoms and the, the few days right after the symptom, we openly discuss with parents and we propose to separate the baby from the mother for some days, maybe two, three days, the, the, the time needed for the mother to be at at least less contagious. Mm -hmm. And we do so, unless the parents, they actually do not want that. And then in that case, clearly, maybe stay with the parents, but uh, enforcing strictly uh, hygiene measures, as you can imagine. Uh, Elaine, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, and I just, Liz, did you want to comment on Liz, that? Yeah. I mean, I mean by that advice, actually, because I don't know if you saw the paper by Chris Gale, one of my colleagues here at Imperial, looking at the UK experience. And we, we would definitely advocate keeping the baby with the mother overall because the data is reassuring. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I think that there would be very rare cases where they wouldn't want to stay together. And I'd love that to be the message. You know, I think particularly in this environment, in the HIV community where we've worked so hard uh, to keep babies with their moms and everything, I think that there are very few cases where we'd need to separate them. Yes, and we're getting a, a suggest from my Gareth to the Williams that we discuss that a little further. Um, Mo, do you have any comments on that? And then Lynn, we'll go to you. Yeah, uh, it's separating. Um, I think <laughs> even in, in a low resource setting, I think separating mothers and, and, and the implications in terms of breastfeeding and other uh, issues, you know, have major impacts. Uh, so certainly from a, you know, from a South African perspective, you know, we've, uh, you know, been quite, you know, if there's, if there's no medical reason to separate mother and baby, the recommendation is that they, they room in together. And actually, the case yeah. data on positive results in um, in obstetric and antenatal clinics, it shows that the really high rate of infection in that cohort, doesn't it, I think? And I don't think they've seen very much neonatal disease. Um, on that. I, I think that there are two things that we should remember. First of all is the power of history over statistics. As I told you, it's only 3% and it's very, uh, very few babies. However, when a baby... Um, uh, come into the NICU with a cerebral vasculitis due to COVID and a COVID meningitis, for those parents, this represents 100% of cases. And this is why, from an ethical perspective, I do believe that we have to inform them. It should be a shared decision, and not separating anybody who actually doesn't want to, but this should be a shared decision. We, we shouldn't say, you know, there's no problem, forget about that. Then, if we look at the guidelines, I can tell you because we did um, a review of uh, many guidelines published so far, you know, from different bodies and scientific societies and, you know, authorities all around the world. Well, we, we did not review every single guideline, but from China, Europe, you know, North America, Australia, and so on. I would say that you can hardly find two guidelines that are actually stating the same thing. You have from from one corner, the Chinese guys who are separating everybody for two weeks, three weeks, like crazy, you know, and so on from, <laughs> from others who actually, who actually do not do anything about that. I believe that the most important thing is informing the parents and take a shared decision. That, 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 that's the, the real point we are trying to do here. 
Lynn, did you have something you wanted to add on this? Uh, no, what I wanted to ask was more a pathogenesis question to Danielle, which is if- I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if we assume that maternal IgG is transplacentally transferred to the infant and that, that IgG is potentially protective, do we think that these severe cases are in mothers who got infected very, very near the time of delivery and therefore haven't had time to develop uh, IgG to pass to their infants? And, um, and that that is, uh, is the etiology and that perhaps that's not necessarily transplacental, that perhaps it's interpartum or in the immediate um, neonatal environment, which once the mother is delivering, particularly if, if it's vaginal, the entire vir environment has SARS-CoV-2 in it, even yeah. if it's sterile yeah. to start. So what about the IgG hypothesis there? Well, um, I think it makes sense. You're totally right. That's a very nice hypothesis. And moreover, you know better than me that, but we've been discussing about that in another in another occasion. And um, uh, for those who are working in neonatology, we know that something like that is happening for other viruses. So it makes sense to imagine something like that also for SARS-CoV-2. Main problem, as you know, is that we, that's a nice hypothesis, but we do not have enough data yet. There's yes. another hypothesis, very nice regarding the placental inflammation, we will be able to prevent viral passage to the fetus, which makes sense because at the end of the day, the transplacental transmission is pretty rare. And we also showed in our second nature paper that uh, the majority of any way of neonatal cases are transmitted horizontally. So they are, uh, they are infected, you know, to drop us to the common route of transmission. But this one, it's a very nice hypothesis. And I believe that we, we can uh, finally prove it or disprove it only with time and with a lot of cases and placental studies. So I, there is a question getting back to um, your comment on vac vaccines, Liz, but yeah, did you want to comment on sure. the I IgG? Oh, I was just wondering about the role yeah. of interferon, but I think um, actually uh, we are probably beyond the scope. Uh, maybe I'll email Danielle <laughs> separately. Um, but I just, I see Di is asking, Di Gibb is asking a yes. question about um, in countries where there's a large proportion of the population being children, we have to balance the risks of a vaccine against the need for herd immunity and vaccine safety trials in children are urgent. And I really agree. I hate to be somebody who says, not to do vaccine trials in children and pregnant women. I normally advocate strongly for that. Um, and I think that we will be getting data quite soon. I think that there is a lot of accumulated data over the last six months that will hopefully report soon. But what's been interesting in those countries where there's a much younger population uh, is that the, the impact of the pandemic has been far less uh, anyway, hasn't it? I think which is uh, really reassuring. It's been really fascinating to watch um, how the pandemic has spread through countries in Africa and, uh, and, uh, and Asia, for example. Um, and I think if we do do vaccine trials, we just have to do them in a really regulated um, and stepwise way, uh, as we obviously would um, to do that. I, I'm very conflicted about this, Di. I tend to agree with you. Uh, Elena, Oops, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Lynn. Um, go ahead. Uh, my comment was about what, what we really know about COVID-19 in kids. And I was going to ask Mo, too. In the studies he showed in the schools, they were looking primarily at symptomatic people. And, and if 80% of the kids who are infected are asymptomatic, I think that perhaps they're there, but they're just not being tested. Um, and, and that's why I think that, that as, we, as we see things um, get unmitigated, we're seeing um, the number of cases increase. In the US, I showed you like two days ago, it was 700,000. Today it's a million yeah, and children, million. Yeah. and 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 so I think that 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 the issue is testing, not necessarily susceptibility. Although I'm not a hundred percent sure. Well, we're doing some zero surveys in several African countries, and there we're seeing seventy percent or more in some countries asymptomatic infection. So yeah. there's much more widespread infection. Yeah. I don't know what you've seen in South Africa. So I think the majority of children, I think, are, are asymptomatic. And I think that's, that's one of the major issues in terms of interpreting any of that data. Uh, because <coughs> that, that predilection to only test uh, symptomatic individuals and follow clusters 
and because it's following a, a public health uh, process. Um, I mean, but I think the, the main message is that, you know, the you know commu schools are within the community, so you can't see it in isolation from the general community. So if you have a generalized community spread, you know, schools will follow that uh, that pathway. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's no 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 place for complacency in terms of uh, in, in terms of what are the you know mitigating strategies that you need to put into place. The one difficulty is, and, and, and what we found is in South Africa, and I'm sure in many other countries, is getting buy-in from the community itself, both in terms of reopening schools, but also maintaining that level of diligence and uh, compliance to that level of, uh, of adherence to, that, uh, to the interventions. So I think it does require a buy-in, I think that's, and getting society to buy into that process. We have a very interesting discussion going on in New York City as our, our rates are going up again and our mayor wants to close the schools but leave bars and restaurants and, and gyms open. Oh yeah. <laughs> the community of parents in particular are really fighting back and saying, what's the logic in this, you know, this because they have not seen many transmissions within the schools. So there's also a political angle that I think has been quite important in the whole response from children. Um, we have a, a question um, wondering whether we're seeing PIMS in adults. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we definitely uh, see some coming through, and it's quite fun because we get asked for advice from our adult colleagues. I quite like that. Um, but um, I would say that it's more of a trickle rather than a flood, if that makes sense. So it, it's kind of it's an unusual occurrence still in the younger adults. The uh, Isaric group uh, with Callum Sample are trying to reanalyze some of their data from the middle of the pandemic to see if they can pick out a phenotype in the huge numbers that would fit amongst older adults. Um, so we may have some data on that coming back. Sorry, Mo, I inter interrupted yeah. you. I think, I think the other thing is to say that, I mean, that in terms of the MISC phenotype, you know, we are seeing essentially the most severe phenotype that there is. And, you know, we've seen a few kids that have extremely mild disease. They don't require, you know, they, they present with the with a fever and, and a bit of a rash, uh, antibody positive, but you know don't require any treatment. So I think you know that they are, you know, if you really look for it, they, there's a lot more of a very mild phenotype that actually goes unnoticed. So there's one other question I want to make sure we get to it before we have to close, which is. A question about COVID vaccine efficacy in children born to women with HIV. And is there any reason to think that the immune response will be less protective? Um, I assume that's based on some of the differences, immunologic differences we're seeing in HIV exposed uninfected children. I can't answer that. I'm not sure anyone on the panel can. Well. I think we can look at the data around other vaccines, though, in that cohort. Um, and we know that children with HIV, particularly well-controlled HIV, have good immune responses to vaccines. So I think we could anticipate it would be the same. Um, but I agree, those are trials that really need to be done as well. Um, and I expect Di Gibb will be taking a role in that somewhere along the way. <laughs> exactly. Well, just to say well, that the, yeah. I mean, no vaccine is doing a study that includes HIV-positive adults. Um, so we'll have some data around the, you know, vaccine efficacy of, of some of these these vaccines in in HIV positive individuals as well. Yeah, there was some um, concern expressed about the adenovector vaccines um, because of the findings from the HIV adenovector vaccine trials and increased risk of HIV acquisition. So that's another thing we need to keep our eye, eyes on. Um, I, I unfortunately we have to end this panel um, because we have to go on and, and finish the meeting. I want to thank each of you for fantastic presentations and for your contributions o over, overall. And thanks for for joining us. And uh, we'll now go to the closing session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.